So Kate von Kemper is going to come and tell us about what she does with BGR, and she's going to talk specifically about those uh, patients who we're doing surveillance on. There might be a little bit of overlap here, as Bijal and I do, and, and Elena do very similar jobs, but I'm focusing on, on surveillance today, and I don't have to tell this room how devastating aortic dissection can be for patients. Um, and unfortunately, the aneurysmal disease that often precedes dissection is an indolent disease, and patients are often asymptomatic at, um, with it. Um, and it's really important to be able to identify patients at risk because um, at the moment the only sort of robust um, management plan we have for patients to prevent dissection is replacement of um, the aneurysmal aorta. Um, so Bijal sort of described the aorta to you. Uh, the aorta pumps about 200 million litres of blood in our lifetime. Um, and for our purposes, we divide the aorta into the ascending aorta, the arch, I don't know if you've got a, which you can see there, and then the descending aorta. Um, and um, aneurysms and dissections of the aorta are classified um, according to those sections. Um, and as Sandy touched on, in medicine, we've all got very specialized and actually the, the medical teams dealing with each portion of the aorta are different as well. And um, therefore, um, this again is a common theme and it'll keep being the theme of today. Um, we require multidisciplinary care in looking after these patients. Um, and in our aorta vascular service, um, we um, are referred all comers with aortic um, disease. Um, and after a, an initial assessment, which um, B. Giles described to you, taking a good family history, doing a clinical assessment, um, we need to ask ourselves a few things. Um, the first is what is normal, so in particularly in patients that we're screening for aortic disease, we need to understand what we would consider normal in the person sitting in front of us. Um, we need to know what the best method of investigating um, that person's aortovascular system is, and that would very much be based upon our initial clinical assessment. Um, and then in those patients who have aortic disease, we need to know um, the best way to follow them up and um, at what intervals to do so. And um, very importantly, we need to know when to intervene. So this is, looks like quite a complicated graph system here, but it's actually quite straightforward. These are no normal aortic dimensions in men on the left-hand side and women on the right-hand side. And already you can see here that actually if you're tall as a, um, as a man, we'd expect you to have a bigger aortic diameter than if you're six foot tall as a woman. So it's gender specific. Um, and that um, you can also see here that if you're taller, we expect you to have a bigger aortic diameter um, than someone who's, who's four foot. Um, and that, as Bijal said, our, the aorta increases um, in size with age as the aorta loses its elasticity. Um, the aortic, uh, the increase in size is approximately one millimeter over a decade, so it's really small increases with age. Um, and we know that in our patients with bicuspid valve, that increase in size with age is um, is, is quicker, so they tend to increase by five millimeters over a decade. Um, and in some of the patients with connective tissue disease, and in particular the, the patients with Marfan and familial thoracic aortic disease, we see a much quicker progression in the size of the aorta. And that guides us on how we 
follow patients up because we don't want to create anxiety in patients with normal size day orders where we keep bringing them back to clinic on a yearly basis and we might increase their interval if we just want to keep an eye on them. Um, so does size matter and as BGEL again has shown um, there was some good retrospective data um, in the 1990s which showed a significant increase in, di um, the, in your risk of dissection as your um, aortic size increased and um, this is from the Yale group and that um, guided those initial um, sort of ballpark guidelines that you should be replacing ascending aortas at 5.5 centimeters. Um, you'll see in this um, graph that dissections do happen at smaller sizes as well um, but when we look back at that data and we, and we look at the population risk, um, your relative risk of having a dissection at a bigger aorta is um, significantly higher than at a smaller aorta. However, that group of patients who have normal aortas are one of our challenges um, for the future, for future research. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if you can see that, but in terms of our ongoing surveillance um, and deciding on how to investigate and, and follow up patients, we need to have a method that's accessible. We need to have a standardized way of measuring. We're talking millimeters here, so we need to be able to put images up next to each other and be quite confident that there's been significant growth. Um, and we need a safe and cost-effective method um, and it needs to be appropriate to the condition that the patient has. So um, this, I'm sure all of the patients in the room will certainly be familiar with, is an echocardiogram. Um, it's traditionally how we have followed up patients and a lot of the literature um, on um, aortic disease is based on echo measurements. So you can see here, um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, this is the aortic valve here, this is the base of the aorta, the sinus uh, valve, and this is the ascending aorta which comes out of the left ventricle, so the heart sort of lying on its left hand side. And you can see here how we make our measurements. Um, and whilst this is a very good um, method of following up the, the base of the aorta, um, which can be useful for patients with the Marfan type of phenotype where that's the area that tends to um, uh, be dilated. Um, it's not as good a method for following up the rest of the aorta. And you can see here the caliber of images that we get of the rest of the aorta um, and it's certainly not good enough for following up patients who've had previous dissection. Um, so we tend to use it as a surveillance tool that's re readily available um, to all of us, but um, often we need other um, ways of imaging the aorta. Um, and uh, this moves us on to a CT scan, which again is quick and accessible to us um, in our hospitals, gives us a quick, easy answer, which is um, very reproducible, gives us some beautiful 3D imaging, um, and we can assess all the complications related to dissection with this. And so a lot of our patients who've had dissection will have relatively regular CT, certainly in the first um, few years after um, dissection. Um, but um, the, the sort of limitations or the downfall of um, CT scan is that um, it requires contrast which um, can affect the kidneys. So if people have got kidney problems, it's an issue. And um, it's also, as, as we all know, it, it exposes us to radiation, which scan by scan is not an issue, but certainly in our younger patients who BGEL and I see a lot of, you wouldn't want to be doing it long term. So um, CT scan, if necessary, is, um, provides us with excellent information, but from a, as a long-term surveillance tool, we tend to use MRI scans. And I'm afraid, um, after all these beautiful pictures, this is not going to play for me today, but this um, is just uh, some imaging from Christian Mortensen, one of our um, 
our um, imaging consultant, and he's got a beautiful video just showing how they line up their aorta to make sure that they're getting the dimensions correct um, with MRI scanning. And MRI gives us a lot of extra information. It gives us information about the valves. It gives us information about the heart function. It gives us all the same information about adjacent structures um, and it can give us some very beautiful 3D angiograms as well. So, as um, Bijal showed, aneurysms um, can develop in different areas, and there's certain, there, we, we know that there's certain patterns of vascular involvement with various conditions, and so we will tailor the tests that we do to that. Um, you can see here, um, the torturous vessels on the right of Lois Dietz, as, um, as BHL showed, and the Marfan phenotype, or Lois Dietz phenotype um, of root in the middle, compared to the bicuspid valve on, on the right, uh, the far right. In our vascular EDS patients, who we know have a uh, kind of have a medium vessel as well as aortic involvement, we need a way of, of screening for um, aneurysms elsewhere. Um, these are patients I see with um, Paul Flora in my clinic because they um, often do have um, problems which relate to their small vessels, not only their aorta. Um, and this is the protocol that our um, imaging team have developed, which is basically a surveillance screen from the neck down to the pelvis, and so it gives us all of the information that we need. Um, and to guide us, as as mentioned earlier, we've got some we've got some good guidance based on on the current literature on, on when we should be in intervening. And why intervene? Well, we know that emergency surgery has a much higher risk and much worse outcomes long term um, than elective um, surgery in this setting. Um, and this is um, the data from John Lefteriades, one of the um, sort of forefathers of aortic surgery, and he's got his. Um, 30, he presents his 30-year experience of prophylactic valve and root replacement, and um, this sort of for the, so shows very beautifully how. Um, so this, in, you can see there's a light grey line there, which is normal and expected survival, and you can see his line of his patients who've had a valve and root replacement, and their survival is, is um, very similar. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a good take-home message, and, and we certainly get very good results, and we know that intervening is important um, and, and worthwhile. Um, I think sort of going forward in terms of, of our imaging and surveillance, as I said, there's a whole group of people that we find difficult to assess risk, and we, we are unable at the moment to assess the strain on the aorta, and it sort of, it, there's a lot of room for future ref, uh, research into um, why people dissect at smaller diameters, um, and, and lots of work to be done. Um, the, the work, the research work done on aortas needs to be a life project like John Lefteriades has had because it takes a long time to get outcome data on aortic disease and that's why it's, it's so great to be part of a team um, like we have here of people who are passionate about aortas and to have this sort of lifelong experience of, from pediatric through to um, through to dissection and through to old age.